Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk about vector spaces and linear maps. And indeed, in today's part 23, we continue our discussion about general linear maps and we will talk about some combinations we can do with them. In particular, we will also talk about the composition of linear maps. However, as always, before we start with the definitions, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And always as a reminder, you can use the link in the description to find additional material for this video. For example, the PDF version and the quiz. Okay, then let's immediately start by recalling the definition of a linear map. And there an alternative name is to talk about a linear operator. It's the same thing, but sometimes a different name helps to distinguish different objects. And now a linear map or a linear operator is always a map between two vector spaces. We call them V and W and there should be vector spaces over the same field of scalars. And you already know, here we usually have the real or complex numbers for that. And now the map is called linear if it satisfies two properties. First, it has to be additive, which means we can pull out the addition. And second, it has to be homogeneous, which means we can pull out scalars. So this is a natural definition for vector spaces, where we only have these two operations, plus and the scalar multiplication. However, now you already know, V could be the vector space of functions, so the input for the linear map would be given by functions as well. And that's why sometimes one speaks of a linear operator, just to distinguish the inputs and the map itself. And there you might remember that in former videos, we already discussed basis isomorphisms for function spaces. And these basis isomorphisms translate the abstract vector space into a very concrete one, namely Rn or Cn. And exactly this is what we will use later to translate such an abstract linear map into a concrete matrix. However, before we do that, we first have to talk about some properties of such linear maps. And the first thing here is that we can combine them with a vector addition and scaling as well. For this, let's fix two general vector spaces again. They can be completely different, but they should have the same field of scalars. And then we just consider two linear maps defined on V. So we have K that goes from V to W and we also have L that goes from V to W. And now since these are two maps with the same domain and codomain, we can easily define a new map we can call K plus L. So this is just adding two maps and you might already know that this can be done by adding in the codomain W. So more precisely, we define the value k plus l of x as k of x plus l of x. So this is well defined because we have an addition in the codomain. So similarly to before, here we have the vector addition in w. However, please note the addition, the plus sign on the left hand side here, is a new plus sign because it denotes the addition of two linear operators. So this is something that wasn't defined before, but now it's defined by this definition. And in a similar way, we can also scale a linear map. For this, we just need a given scalar, lambda from f. And then as before, we can just define lambda times l of x. And again, we do that by simply scaling the value that comes out from the linear map l. So what we have is that this multiplication sign is the scalar multiplication in W. So there you see, this is how we define the addition of linear maps and the scalar multiplication of linear maps. In fact, this definition already works if we have a vector space structure on the right hand side. So we need to know how to apply these operations here for the values. And then lambda times L for example already makes sense as a map. However, if we also have the vector space structure here on the left hand side, then the term linear makes sense. And now the really nice result here is that the new maps we define here 
are also linear maps. In fact, this is something you can check. K plus L, for example, still satisfies the two properties for a linear map. And of course, this is exactly what we want to have. If we already have linear maps, we want to form new ones. Therefore, now our result here is, with the two operations, addition and scalar multiplication, the set we can call L V W, defined by the linear maps from V to W, is a vector space again. More precisely, it's an F vector space again. In other words, we can calculate with linear maps as we can do it with abstract vectors. So you could say this is a new abstract level, but still all the calculation rules for a vector space are satisfied here. So for example, this means we also have a zero vector in this vector space. More precisely, the zero vector also has to be a linear map. More precisely, it has to be the zero map, which sends every vector x in v to the zero vector in w. Indeed, this is something you should always keep in mind. We have different zeros in different vector spaces. Okay, so this is our result. We can check that all the eight rules for a vector space are satisfied for our linear maps. So now you could say we have a new example of an abstract vector space here. But I would say, in order to get more concrete again, let's look at an example for a linear map again. Let's consider a vector space V with an inner product given with the pointed brackets. And let's say it's a finite dimensional vector space with an O and B denoted by E1, E2 and so on. Moreover, let's say we have a subspace U which is spanned by n minus 1 of these vectors. Then we already know the definition of the orthogonal projection onto U. And indeed, this defines a linear map on V. So maybe let's call the map projection with index U. And as already mentioned, this goes from V into V again. And there we already know, the definition can be written with the inner product and a sum. More precisely, we have the sum that goes from j is equal to 1 to n minus 1. And then we have the vector ej with the scalar ej in the inner product with x. So this is the orthogonal projection onto u as we know it, and now we can see it's a linear map as well. This is not hard to see, because we already know that the inner product is linear in the second argument. And now please recall the picture we have in mind here. If we have a vector x there, then here we find the orthogonal projection in u. Moreover, in the same sense, we can also define the normal component here. In fact, this would be the orthogonal projection onto the orthogonal complement of u. So this means we can write it as a sum again, but now the sum only has one term. Namely, it's just the last vector in our own b, en. And don't forget the scalar, inner product en with x. And by the same reasoning, this is also a linear map. And now what we could easily do is to add both linear maps here. And now not so surprising, if we use the addition here, what we get out is the identity map on V. You see that immediately, both projections added gives us the vector x back. Moreover, we could also do another combination here, namely we could subtract both projections. And please never forget, subtraction just means that we multiply the one vector with the scalar minus one and then we use the vector addition again. However, now in the picture here, you see the subtraction means that we land with our result below the subspace u. So what you could say is that we reflect the vector on the subspace u. So you could see it as a mirror and then we have a reflection going on. And indeed, we could also rewrite that as identity minus two times the one projection. So if we subtract two times the normal component here, we land at this position, which gives us the reflection. But now the important thing for us is that this is also a linear map. Okay, and now I would say, let's end this video by quickly talking about the composition. So you know, you can always build a composition of two functions if the domains and codomains fit together. So here we could say we have a vector space u 
a vector space v and a vector space w. And now between u and v, we have a linear map k. And between v and w, we have a linear map l. And now the result is that the composition l after k is also a linear map. So this is important to remember and easy to show. If we have two linear maps, the composition is also linear. So more formally, if we have k from this set, from this vector space and l from the other one, then the composition lies also in a vector space. And as the picture says it, it maps u to w. And indeed, I would say it's a good exercise. You can show that the property linear translates to the composition as well. And you should already know, composition is an important construction we have in mathematics and therefore we can immediately apply it to an example. So you could consider the projection from above and let's combine it with itself. And then you might already know what we get out is the same projection again. So doing an orthogonal projection twice does not change anything. However, what happens if we form the composition with the two different projections? And there it's important to see that both spaces are orthogonal to each other, which means they cancel each other out. So no matter what we put in here, we always get out the zero vector. Which means the output as a linear map we get here is the zero vector in our vector space LVV. And with that, you should already see that the composition as an operation gives a very nice structure on this vector space here. So you might already know, in some sense, it represents a multiplication in the vector space. And in fact, this is something we already know on the concrete level in Rn as the matrix multiplication. However, in this course, we will discuss it in more generality and we will do that in the next videos. Hence, I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.